What is the background of the three main medieval Jewish commentators, Rashi, Rambam, and Rambam, who commented on the book of Deuteronomy and the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament? What are the core principles of Judaism and Christianity, and how are they similar, and how do these faith traditions differ? Why do the Jewish versions of the Torah use multiple names for God? What laws should Christians follow? Can Christians draw inspiration from all the laws in Deuteronomy and the Torah? How can Deuteronomy be both a book of the law as well as a book encouraging the love of God and love of neighbor? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare, which includes illustrations. Our sister blog includes footnotes, and both include our Amazon book links. What is the core directive of both Judaism and Christianity? The twofold love, that we should love God with all of our hearts and with all of our souls and with all of our mind and with all of our strength and really with all of our all, and that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. All else is commentary, as the rabbis teach us. At roughly the time of Jesus, an inquirer requested of both Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel, convert me to Judaism on condition that you will teach me the entire Torah while I stand on one foot. Shammai pushed the man away with the building rod he was holding. Undeterred, the man then came before Hillel with the same request. Hillel responded, That which is hateful unto you, do not do unto your neighbor. This is the whole Torah. All else is commentary. Now go and study. Who had the correct approach? Both rabbis were correct. Both had valid lessons to teach. Likewise, Christians can learn from both the teachings of the church fathers and the medieval rabbis. One difference between the two faiths is Christianity and their Greek culture wants everything to be logical and fit together and seeks to harmonize any apparent discrepancies in the Holy Scriptures. On the other hand, Judaism instead seeks to find differing lessons for verses of scripture that seem to conflict. One example is that the commandments for do not covet are worded differently in Exodus and Deuteronomy, so we can learn from their differing emphasis. A key work by St. Augustine reaffirms this twofold love of God and love of neighbor. St. Augustine is my favorite Catholic saint because, in every major work, he explicitly reminds us that this twofold love is the core of Christian beliefs. In his foundational essay on Christian teaching, he teaches us that all Holy Scripture, properly interpreted, must increase in our heart our twofold love of God and love of neighbor. And if any biblical story appears to violate this twofold love, then it must be interpreted allegorically. Now, how did the rabbis interpret the harsh penalties, such as death by stoning and putting out the eyes and limbs of offenders, for some of the various laws in the Torah? They simply say that these strictures emphasize the importance of obeying these moral laws, but that the modern penalty should be reasonable, fitting the crime. The best example of the allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament are these famous verses in Psalm 137. O oh, daughter Babylon, you devastator! Happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us! Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock! This is a favorite verse of the Eastern Monastic Church Fathers in the Philokalia, they interpret this verse as exhorting us to eliminate all the sins in our life, both large and small. Another rabbinical example is the mitzvah about the red heifer. The precise meaning of the phrase red heifer mentioned in a law in Deuteronomy is lost in the sands of history. So it is interpreted by the rabbis as teaching us that we should obey all the commandments of God, even when they don't make sense to us. Likewise, although Christians believe that many of the dietary, ritual, and festival laws are no longer binding, the spiritual allegorical interpretation remains. This will be an introduction to our reflections on how the last book of the Torah, Deuteronomy, is both a book of the law as well as a book exhorting us to love God in close to 20 passages. We will also examine the commentaries by the medieval rabbis, Rashi, Rambam, also known as Maimonides, and Rambam, also known as Nachmanides. Rabbi Ibn Ezra is also a highly esteemed medieval rabbi, but his works are famously terse. Born in the 11th century in France, Rashi was the most esteemed commentator of the Jewish Torah, as well as the other books of the Jewish Bible and the Talmud. Much of the rabbinical writings since discuss his commentary. We use the Jewish Bible, the Medusa Chumash Torah, 
that has both the Hebrew and the English, with Rashi's commentary, and with commentary of his often terse commentary. And Rashi's commentary is also available on the internet on the Shabbat.org website. Rambam, born in Spain in the 12th century in Moorish Muslim Spain, was perhaps an equally influential rabbi. He summarized the oral law in an influential 14-volume Mishnah Torah. One of the major works of Rambam is a summary from the Talmud of the 613 mitzvah, or commandments, with 248 positively stated commands, followed by 365 negative commands. And the 248 commands correspond to how many bones the ancients thought were in the human body, although we now know there are many more, and the 365 days of the year. Each of the Ten Commandments is included, and all of the other commandments elaborate on one or more of these Ten Commandments. He also penned the Guide to the Perplexed, which was a Jewish reflection of Aristotle's philosophy. Ramban, with an N, or Nachmanides, lived in the 13th century, and he was born in Christian Spain soon after the years of the Reconquest. He defended Judaism in a disputation with Christians, arguing persuasively that the Christian belief in the Trinity doesn't make any logical sense. And of course, this greatly offended the Spanish church authorities, and he felt compelled to emigrate to the Middle East. But he does make a good point that Christianity doesn't make any logical sense. Christianity is based on the thought that Jesus is both God and man, and part divine and part human. And we have a trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Yet we have one God, which makes no logical sense. Also, there's a verse in the New Testament that says that the teenage Jesus learned. But if God is omniscient, Knowing everything, how can the young Jesus learn? Think about that too hard and you'll tangle yourself up in all kinds of conundrums. It's best not to interpret that verse too heavily, just accept it. How does St. Augustine make sense of the Christian Trinity? He summarizes its essence in seven declarations. The Father is neither the Son nor the Holy Spirit. The Son is neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. And God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. And there's only one God. Furthermore, the Ecumenical Councils and Church Fathers teaches us that Jesus is equally God and equally man, and also that the will of Christ is equally divine and human. You can argue that Christianity invented theology to try to explain the Trinity of God. Judaism has fewer doctrinal differences than Christianity. The differences between Reformed, Conservative, and Orthodox Jews are generally disagreements on practice, and to what degrees the law should be followed literally, or whether the meaning of some laws are more allegorical. This may reflect that Jews are less polemic about their differences, less willing to attack others over disagreements over interpretation. For example, when Ram Ban disagrees with certain teachings of Rashi, he never personally attacks the venerable commentator, but rather speaks of him with profound respect. This, and the Jewish tendency to welcome varying interpretations, enables Judaism to avoid some of the polemic arguments that are so common in Christianity. Now, why are we interested in this topic? Much current and classic Christian theology begins with the premise that the God is a God of mercy, whereas the Old Testament God is a God of judgment, and that, as St. Paul exhorts, the letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, my reflections are based solely on my reading. I've only attended one bar mitzvah and one synagogue service. Now, this was not possible in the ancient world before the invention of the printing press. In the ancient world, if you wanted to study the Torah using the Talmud and the writings of the Jewish rabbis, you were forced to visit the synagogue, because that's where they were. You just could not study these works without becoming involved in the synagogue. And Christians who mixed the faith like these were named Judaizers, and they were condemned by both St. Paul the Apostle and St. John Chrysostom. Although we observed that Chrysostom's criticisms crossed over into anti-Semitism. Now, we want to emphasize that these condemnations are directed towards the Judaizers among the Christians rather than the Jews themselves. Now, unfortunately, in medieval Europe, these attitudes evolved into virulent anti-Semitism by all Christians, and possibly the most extreme form was the anti-Semitism of Martin Luther. Now, I've always been baffled by those who claim that Christians no longer need to study the law, because if you seek to learn how to live a godly life, don't you want to know how? And similarly, I'm baffled by Protestants who likewise neglect the study of the Church Fathers and the Catholic Catechism for similar reasons. Our reflections in this channel are respectful to all mainstream Judeo-Christian traditions, and we prefer to learn from these traditions on how to live a godly life, and we're reluctant to criticize and find faults so we can argue that our traditions are superior. And St. Augustine and I both emphasize that you need to go to a church, you need to pick one. 
but for the purposes of these videos, I prefer not to reveal my denomination. In that spirit, the criticisms of the Pharisees made by Jesus in the Gospels seem like insider criticisms. You can be harsher in self-criticizing than you can when you're criticizing people outside your culture. But this exhortation to value the spirit over the letter of the law is also exclaimed in the Old Testament, as King David sings in the penitential psalm, bewailing his sin with Bathsheba. You have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you will not be pleased. The only sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This exhortation is repeated many times by the prophets. Does the Christian gospel reject the Jewish law, or does the Christian gospel reaffirm the Jewish law? Early in its history, Christianity faced the heresy of the Gnostic Marcion, who declared that the judgmental God of the Old Testament was a vengeful demiurge, and that Jesus was the newly righteous God, which led him to declare that the Christian Bible should omit the Old Testament. Marcion's Bible only contained ten Pauline epistles and an edited version of Luke. Marcion's teachings were rejected by the early church. Many early church fathers, including St. Irenaeus and St. Justin Martyr, embraced the Old Testament as part of the Christian scriptures. And what is another key difference in emphasis between Christians and Jews when they study the books of the Old Testament? While Jews reflect on the entire Torah during the annual readings in their synagogue services and recite the Shema, Christians skip around, favoring those parts that point to Jesus Christ. One overriding principle of Jewish exegesis is the most important commands are repeated in both positive and negative forms. One example of this is the negative command, do not murder. The positive form of the command is to love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, Christians can include the number of times a command is repeated in both the Old Testament and New Testament to judge their importance. Another principle of both Jewish and Christian biblical exegesis is you should not interpret any verse by itself. You should read the chapters surrounding the verse, then interpret it in the context of first the book as a whole, and then the Bible as a whole. Another tendency that makes me cringe is when people want to look up the meaning of biblical words in the Merriam-Webster dictionaries. Don't do that. Find out the biblical meanings of the words. The Torah, or the first five books of the Old Testament, the Psalms, and the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are similar in style. They have many couplets where the second sentence rephrases and amplifies the first sentence. And this is poetry that echoes thoughts and beliefs rather than syllables. And one example is the first psalm, which is a collection of couplets whose lines rhyme in thought rather than in the spoken word. Happier are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in due season. And their leaves do not wither, and all that they do they prosper. The first psalm celebrates the law as gospel. Our delight is to study the law. As C.S. Lewis in his commentary on the Psalms observes, not only are we to obey the laws expressed in the Decalogue and the other laws, but our delight is to also study the law, to meditate on the law day and night. When we reflect on the twofold law of God, we must remember the spiritual struggle with the demons that C.S. Lewis depicts in his screw tape letters. The deceiver would rather that we not be religiously devout, but if he fails in this effort, the deceiver then seeks that we should instead be judgmental and hypocritical. Likewise, the deceiver would rather that we not study scripture, but if he fails in that effort, the deceiver seeks that our studies would be corrupted by conceit and pride in our learning, which are dangerous for both Jews and Christians. Another example is this verse in Matthew that follows the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Now in the Jewish tradition, the word of God is holy and should not be said, so we do not know the ancient pronunciation for sure. Many English translations render it as Jehovah or Yahweh. But in the Hebrew Bible, this holy word is replaced by either Adonai for the merciful aspect of God, or Elohim for the judgmental aspect in God. Wherever the English translation renders the name as Lord, Lord, the underlying Hebrew is rendered as Adonai, Elohim. Similarly, in a famous icon of Jesus from the 5th century, from the oldest continuously occupied monastery in the world, in the Mount Sinai Monastery in the deserts of Egypt, one half of his face shows the compassion of Jesus, while the other half shows Jesus the judge who separates the lambs from the goats at the end of the world. 
Now, when reading the Old Testament, remember that both the ancient Greek and ancient Jewish city-states were ancient warrior cultures. Unlike today, when we look forward to a retirement funded by Social Security, in the ancient world you worried instead that a hostile army would someday plunder your city-state, rob you of all your possessions, execute all military-age men, and enslave the women and children. The Babylonians were uncharacteristically kind when they deported the Jews all of the Psalms hint that they were guilty of many cruelties. However, the Babylonians did permit the Jews to settle in their own communities in Babylon. There, some of them might have been the equivalent of serfs, but their independent community was sufficiently prosperous to support rabbis who studied the Torah. The Assyrians were crueler. Perhaps they obliterated the culture of the ten lost tribes of Israel by enslaving them. Perhaps this is why these ten lost tribes were lost in the sands of history. In the cold and cruel ancient world, you cannot expect the ancient Jews to love their enemies. This means that the laws in the Torah command the Hebrews to instead to love their Hebrew neighbors. But even in the ancient world, these cultures lost their warrior ethos several generations after they were conquered by an empire, whether it be the Persian Empire in ancient Greek history or the Roman conquest of Judea before the time of Christ. Along with losing their warrior ethos, they also lost their fear that neighboring powers might attack and defeat their city-states since they were under the protection of Rome. This meant that, unlike Moses, Jesus could exhort his followers to love both our enemies and our neighbors. And another interesting piece of evidence showing that the ancient Jewish culture was indeed a warrior culture is the Song of the Sea in Exodus, which was sung shortly after they crossed the Red Sea. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and riders he has thrown into the sea. Again, the couplets. The Lord is my strength and my might, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And we do still think that way today. We still want God to help us to be successful in our career, help us to be successful in our marriage, and help us to be successful in life. But whether you're a Jew or a Christian, your faith should be deeper than merely selfish demands for success. Our faith should instead be anchored in our love of God and love of neighbor, regardless of the success or defeats we suffer in our lives. Love should trump prosperity. And just because life denies us prosperity and brings us suffering instead, we should still love God and love our neighbor. Because after all, all else is commentary. And this reflection introduces our reflection on how Deuteronomy is first a book of love, exhorting us to love God in about 20 verses. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. We have another video reflecting on the commentaries of the medieval rabbis, Rashi, Rambam, and Ramban, plus many modern summaries of the modern collections of the moral teachings from the Talmud and the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. What other scholars have noted the similarities between the style of the Torah and the Synoptic Gospels? We have noted that Professor Peter Van Wright has written a book on this topic, Reading Torah, The Key to the Gospels. Plus, we have viewed an excellent DVD series of short movies on the Decalogue recommended by Roger Ebert. Plus, we have several more books on the Decalogue and the Torah, and we plan a video on these topics sometime in 2024. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.